covering the song Global Warming here on Democracy Now!, democracynow.org, the War and Peace Report. Uh, we are broadcasting from Durban, South Africa. We are broadcasting from the UN Conference on Climate Change, a gathering of over 190 countries from around the world and their delegates. But perhaps for some more importantly, thousands of people around the world have converged on Durban, South Africa. I'm Amy Goodman. On Sunday, Democracy Now! producer Mike Burke attended the World Climate Summit, a side conference here in Durban sponsored by a number of corporations, including Siemens and Coca-Cola, Philips, Dow, and Duke Energy. Several members of the Nigerian delegation to the UN Climate Conference were there. I came from Mashu State, um, Nigeria. Uh, I represent the Ministry of Environment and Sanitation as the Commissioner in Charge. How does Nigeria reconcile the fact that Africa as a continent stands to be affected most by climate change at the same time that Nigeria is pushing ahead with the exploration of oil? Well, did Nigeria is pushing ahead with exploration of oil. And that is not to say that we lack the consciousness of renewable energy like biofuel. It's just that it is what, since the 70s, there had been over-reliance on the oil sector, which is the organic um, fossil oil. But right away, I can assure you, like I said, for my state, and I'm thinking that it's, it's, a, it's a national, we're thinking in terms of when the oil will not be there. When the oil will not be there, what will be the next step for Nigeria? Well, one more question. Have the international oil companies, including Shell and Chevron, done enough to help the Nigerian people that, number one, have been affected by climate change, as well as the environmental degradation of parts of the country? Um, let me tell you that I will, I will be unfair if I judge Chevron or Shell or Slumberger about what they have done. I know that initially Nigerians particularly do not have enough information to start with about climate change. But right away, Nigerian is educated about climate change. That's why we are here. And I'm sure we can we can continue to talk. What we were talking about priorly was uh, oil spillages, cleaning up, uh, community development for these companies. And uh, in recent years, they have particularly performed and improved over their past performance. Nigerian delegate to the UN Conference on Climate Change, Nemo Basir Gessig, he's head of uh, Friends of the Earth International. Your response that the records of these oil companies like Chevron, like Shell, are improving? The records of the oil corporations in Nigeria, Shell, Chevron, Exxon, Ajib from Italy, the records have not changed. I tell you, every day, even while I'm here in Durban, I'm receiving messages from home about new oil spills. Two days ago, we had five oil spills on one pipeline alone. They, they, they're still not maintaining their equipment. They're still inviting the military to suppress communities. Last week, three youths were killed in Ogoni land just because they resisted um, an effort for land grabbing to be carried out in their territory. And I should just mention this, although it's historical, but it's an ongoing reality. The United Nations Environmental Program just issued a report on the environment, environmental assessment of Ogoni land. And we believe that that assessment is not as, it doesn't show a result as severe as what would be carried out if such a study were to be done in an area where active oil extraction would be, where is still continuing. Now, oil extraction stopped in Ogoni land in 1993 and was followed by the execution of Ken Salawiwa in 1995. But the study by UNEP shows that the Ogoni environment is polluted so severely that it will require 30 years to clean up the waters in Ogoni land, five years to clean up the land. The land is polluted in some places to a depth of five meters. The water is polluted with benzene to a level of 300 times, 900 times above World Health Organization standards. And as I speak to you, people are still drinking that kind of water. All over the Niger Delta, in the places operated by Shell, by Exxon, by all these multinational oil companies, they are carrying out mayhem against the planet. 
Democracy Now! also met up with a number of Nigerian youth activists here at the UN Climate Change Summit. Uh, Democracy Now!'s Mike Burke asked them about the government's view on oil exploration. I'm the executive director for Youth Vision Alliance Network, a youth-led organization based in Lagos that work to empower youth with sustainable leadership skills uh, through workshops, seminars, and other means. Yesterday, we met up. Uh, we were at a meeting, and there were members of the Nigerian delegation there. And I asked one member of the delegation if she believed that Shell and Chevron had done enough to help the people of the Niger Delta deal with the environmental crisis there as well as to deal with climate change. And essentially, she wouldn't criticize the oil companies at all. Uh, I'm just curious to see your thoughts on that. Well, uh, it's not surprising because for over 20 or 30 years, the government have been protecting the polluters in, in, uh, the, uh, to the detriment of the people down there. They hardly hear their voice. Even now that we have a president that is from that region, the region is still underdeveloped. So I'm not surprised that a government official will not openly criticize Shell and Chevron. These are people that are polluting the, the, the place. These are people that are messing up the, the livelihood, the life of people living in this place. And our government are not standing up for us. So it's high time that we as, as youths and concerned citizens need to rise up to this occasion. We don't believe in our government to deliver this promise. We don't believe in them to give us the deal we really need. We have to step up, and we are doing that already. Nima Bassi here in Durban, South Africa as well, one of the leaders of the environmental movement, not only in Nigeria, but around the world as head of uh, Friends of the Earth International. Nemo, the solutions. They may not be being talked about inside this UN conference, but outside in the streets at the uh, KwaZulu Natal University, where so many of the side conferences are taking place, the youth, um, the longtime experienced environmentalists. Talk about what you see is what has to be done now. From the public people's spaces and from discussions going on from analysis from social movements, one of the, the biggest challenge to finding a solution to global warming is the overpowering control of politicians by transnational corporations. The delegates are listening more to these people, to this organization, than listening to people. Would you believe that Nigeria has a sh at least one shell official on its official delegation to the conference? So, you know, we are looking for a, a, a situation where the, so the decisions on cl global warming will be taken by people, not by the corporates. And so one of the key things to be done is to decolonize our governments. We, look, we, we, we are holding, we're believing that the solution will come by peoples from the, from, the, from the outside of these conference halls. We have to change the entire paradigm. Because right now, I mean, it's been right to call this a conference of polluters, a conference of hypocrites, a conference of people who are not listening to voices, the democratic voices of people on the streets. So we need to look at the fundamental cause of global warming, move away from fossil fuels, leave the oil in the soil, leave the coal in the hole, leave the tar sands in the land. As long as the world continues to be addicted and hooked on the fossil fuel-driven civilization, there's not going to be any solution. So we need to shift to renewable energy. We need to shift to community discrete, small-scale control energy forms and not on mega grids, mega dams, and all other dirty forms of energy production. Are you giving up on the conference inside this convention center? I believe we have to interrogate uh, the level of participation by civil society on the inside. And from, from my personal analysis, we still need to have some people who can inform us on the outside about what is going on in the rooms, what's going on in the corridors, what's going in the so-called green rooms and secret rooms. But we need to invest more energy in opening up the space for debates and more conferences of the people, like Cochabamba. We need to draw up the solutions and push the political structures to agree to real solutions, not coming here to negotiate on climate finance that is not being on the table at all, not coming to conferences like this where carbon is being traded 
and nothing is being done. Explain what you mean by carbon traded. Well, the, carbon, carbon, the, the, the major debates here and what gives some delegates hope is that they could, if they had forest, they will not see forest for the value of forest, the natural value of nature, but they will see trees as carbon stock. So they could say, well, I got the forest, pay me some, you know, I want to obtain some carbon credits or some money to the, protect the forest. But forest protection and forest as a carbon stock are two different things. Well, for people who don't understand the issue of carbon trading, if you're talking about countries or companies that are polluting in another area of the world, saying they can continue to pollute, but they will buy up an area, um, perhaps in the rainforest, uh, perhaps in Africa. And what do they do? What happens to the people in those areas? This is, this is one of the issues that is not being examined when they talk about reducing emissions from deforestation and forest degradation. Which the, goes to the issue of what's called red. Red, and now they talk about emissions. Actually, the conference is looking for how to introduce more market mechanisms rather than are carrying out real solutions. What happens is that rich countries or rich industries, polluting industries, would secure a forest, buy up the forest somewhere in Africa or Asia or Latin America, and then there will be a review process to examine and determine how much carbon is being held by those trees. And then carbon credits are issued, and they would now match it with the level of pollution they carry out either in Europe or somewhere else, and whatever is extra, if they say, well, we're not polluting as much as the trees are holding, then they can sell the extra or extra credits to another polluter who would continue to The idea is to keep on polluting while pretending something is being done. But you see, seeing trees as carbon sink is patently false. I mean, trees do hold carbon. We have carbon in our bodies. We're all, at the end of the day, made up of carbon. So, but the thing is that trees don't live forever. So one day the tree is going to die, and the carbon you say the tree is holding is going to be released. So, and you stop deforestation in one place, you don't stop deforestation somewhere else. So all these are the false solutions being drawn up by polluters who are powerful enough to drive the system, and weak countries think they can get money from this process. And so, like somebody drinks, say, I want to, I'm thirsty, but let me drink poison for today. Maybe I live for two days. This is it's all false solution. We're asking for a real solution. Stop emissions at source. Nima Basi, I want to thank you for being with us. His new book is called To Cook a Continent, Destructive Extraction and the Climate Crisis in Africa. Nima Basi, head of environmental rights action in Nigeria and chair of the international organization Friends of the Earth International.